I'm excited about this message today because uh, I really had to wrestle with this one. I'll be honest, guys. This one I had to wrestle with. But I saw it, and then it all kind of came together, and I'm really thinking this is kind of a key, one of those things where you go, wow, I get this, this is helpful. So I'm not trying to like <laughs> set the bar too high, but I really think this is good. Um, because it, it, we've been going through, this is the fifth mes- message we've gone through on the story of David. And we've just been working through, you know, since the beginning of David in, the, in 1 Samuel and just kind of stories by stories by story. And we've kind of been soaring over these things because there's a lot to cover. We're moving through it through the, through the summer. So in order to do that, we're kind of, you know, covering a lot of things each week. And then during the week, Pastor Kevin helps with, you have a daily email that goes out. You can sign up for it on our website that kind of leads you through it at a more reasonable pace of reading and that kind of thing, because we don't want to leave too many things out. But I like doing this, because sometimes uh, when you go through the Bible in small chunks, you can go really deep into small chunks, and that's important and powerful. And then sometimes when you take a bigger picture, you see a different uh, perspective of God doing something. And it's good to do both, you know. It's good to read through the Bible in very small segments and really dwell on them. And it's also good to sit down and read a chunk of it, you know what I mean? And this right here is coming out of a chunk of several chapters of the end of uh, 1 Samuel, or near the end. And like I said, it's our fifth message on David, but it's like the third message in a row where David is in kind of in the wilderness and dealing with this. And if you remember two weeks ago, I think it was a very important time when we saw David who had been like, you know, David and Goliath is the thing you all think about. Like, it's like, oh, man, this is awesome, and he's the king, and he's killing giants, and I want to be like that, and that's great. And that happened already in this story. And then you go into, like, weeks and weeks of wilderness, which is kind of weird, but kind of like our lives, I think, especially recently, as, pa- as Jackson just mentioned. We're, we've definitely been in a wilderness as a society. Would you not agree? Yes. Okay. But two weeks ago, we talked about the role of the wilderness in a believer's life. And and Marianne came up and shared what the Lord had shown her about Jesus binding the strong man in the wilderness. And I hope you understand the significance of that. And I hope that had an impact on you and that you felt the weight of that, that Jesus is the one that is binding the strong man in our lives. And then last week, Pastor Kevin spoke about us kind of abiding and taking refuge in God himself in those places of wilderness, that that is always offered to us. So I get to do this third week where maybe things don't always go so great, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so I've called this message, <clears throat> sorry, taking matters in our own hands or matters in our own hands. <clears throat> when you're in a, a uh, wilderness for a short time, you can, man, praise God, praise God, brother, everything's great. You know, Jesus is going to lead me through it. It's all good. You know, I'm, you know. Half of that's fake, but it's okay. We'll let you do it, you know. But sometimes it ends and you're like, hey, I made it through. We're good, you know. And then there's another time, like, you know, you get into that second week and you're like, okay, I really need to take refuge in God here because I'm not going to make it. Like, I can see how much further I have to run and it ain't in there. You know that. So you need some refuge, you know. Now we're getting to a place where, like, maybe you ran out a little. What do you do? This is an interesting, we're going to look at four stories today. In part, I'm not going to go in depth on all of these, but you can go back and read them, like I said, and you will if you get our emails. The first story is David spares Saul's life again. (laughs) Then David joins the Philistines, which if you've been paying attention, that should be a weird story point that you're like, what? Then Saul and the witch, also weird. And then at the end, we have David and the Philistine king. And then we'll pull it all together. But there's one focus I want you to look at all of these things as we're going through, is are we trusting God? Are they trusting God? Or are we trusting, or are we taking matters into our own hands, which is really trusting ourselves, okay? And you're going to start to relate to these things because when the wilderness gets a little too long, you start to just go, you know what, I'm ready for this to be over, so here's what we're going to do to end it, right? And I'll just tell you right now, it never works. But we're going to go through it anyway because following God is difficult. And you need to know that. You need to expect that. You need to live that out because what we, we're, we're kind of like put to sleep, maybe more in our country than other places because of the level of comfort we live in. But we're put to sleep into this idea that if I follow God 
everything in my life, meaning all of the little details, like my air conditioning, he was talking, all these kinds of things, those things are always just going to work out because I'm following God. And that's just not true. It's not in the Bible really anywhere. God takes care of you. But those kind of things, like it, when you follow God, those kind of things, there's an increase of those kinds of things in your life that go wrong. Sometimes directly because of that, that you're following him. But you can have joy in the midst of it, which is completely different than happiness or just pleasure, okay? Am I getting too complicated too fast? Okay. Let's go ahead and get into this story. Because following God is awesome, but it's difficult. And we're often tempted to take matters in our own hands, just like these guys were. So first story, David spares Saul's life again. I'm going to read this just chunk here. Because, again, if you remember, like, Saul's like, Oh, David, how could I stay mad at you? And then he's like, never mind, I'll kill him again. And then he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. How could I stay mad at you? Oh, never mind, I'll kill him again. And it's like, fine, you know, it kind of goes back and forth. And then last week, Saul's chasing David again. And Pastor Kevin went through the whole story of he's like in the cave. Saul's using the bathroom, which is awkward. And his men are like, hey, you know what? You should kill the guy because here he is. God has put him before you. Like, you know, and he's like, no, I can't do it. And he, but he takes a piece of his robe just to show him like, hey, look. I didn't kill you when I could have, maybe. And then he's like, okay, I promise I won't kill you again. And then here we are again. He's like, never mind, I do want to kill you. So he's chasing David again. So Saul, this is starting in verse 2. So Saul went, of chapter 26. So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with 3,000 select Israelite troops to search there for David again. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakila facing Jeshimon. But David stayed in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. So David and Abishai went, went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers, Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't have to strike him twice, or I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Now listen to this. Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish, but the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug near his head and let's go. So just so we're clear, because I'm going to be Frank, later, this is the point of the story where I would have failed <laughs> in taking matters in my own hands. I think I'm like, I'm trusting God. Like, he got me. Th- if I'm David, we've already done the, the Goliath thing, which was pretty significant, and God saved me enough from the Saul guy. And, I tur- I, and the first time in the cave, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that because, you know, I'm going to leave this up to God. But then, you know, if you read that story when they're in the cave, the guys don't make a bad case. They're like, you know, God said he's going to deliver him into your hands. Like, That's where we are, you know, and he's like, no, that's, this isn't that, you know, but if it happened a second time, that's where I'd have been like, yeah, I, you say Jimmy crack corn, yeah, when he's like, can I just run him through really quick, I'd be like, yeah, go ahead and do that, you know, I probably would have failed there, so if you're saying, man, you think you're so great, you're talking about these guys, like, this is where I would have failed, so it's step one, I would have failed, but David doesn't, David, again, has almost the same exchange with Saul, like, you know, he wakes him up the next day. He's like, see, I could have killed you again. I got your stuff. I've got your, your jug and all this. And, like, these guys didn't protect you. And, I st- you know, and Saul's like, oh, my gosh, again, I'm so sorry. I'll never kill you again. But we know how that goes. And so I would give David a pretty high grade on trusting God here because he lays it out here. Like, the Lord himself will take care of this. I'm not going to take this matter in my own hands, right? So we're going to give David an A on story one, right? Well, let's go to story two, though. This is where it starts to get... So I would have failed. I would have had an F on story one. All right, so just make sure you know that. I'm not talking bad about David as if I would have done better. I'm just going to say this next story gets a little weirder, okay? And you have to start wrestling with this stuff. Slide two, or, you know, story two. David joins the Philistines. So even though Saul promises again to not kill him again after David didn't kill Saul again, Saul, David's not doesn't trust that. So David thought to himself... One of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. Think of this. One of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape the land of the Philistines. 
Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. So David took 600 men, and they left, and they went to, over to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. So, if you just read through that, you go, yeah, that Saul guy's not changing. He really is exactly going to kill you, you know. But if you juxtapose this thought that David has with what he just said, the Lord himself will strike him down, and a time will come when he will die, and he will not go into, you know, all this. Which one of those sounds like they're trusting God here? The first one. The second one is the beginning of taking matters into his own hands, where he's like, you know, God never said Saul's going to kill you. He said, you're going to be the king. And up until right before this, he's like, yeah. And all of a sudden, he's like, and it's not unwarranted. So, like, again, like, let's not bash David here for a second. Because Saul's certainly not stopping trying to kill him. So when we encounter these kind of things in our circumstances, like, the circumstances are going to tell you a lot of stuff. You know, like, hey, that's not, it, it, this will kill me. So, I, you know, that kind of thing. But God has said something else. So he's starting to deviate from, you know, I'm going to go over to the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were, like, if you remember where Goliath was from, not exactly our pals, you know, if you're Israel. Akish is the same guy that in chapter 21 he tried to pretend like he was crazy in front of so that he wouldn't have him killed, you know. So kind of a low point. So now he's starting to, um, he's starting to take matters into his own hands. But then it starts to get worse because he has to, so he hides out. He, he talks to, he's like, hey, man, like, maybe I could just come help you guys out. And they're like, yeah, okay, sure. Will you come help us? And he's like, okay, well, how about this? Let me go down away from you guys. Like, I don't need to hang out right here with you guys. I'll hang out down here, and I'll, you know, take care of things for you guys. And they're like, yeah, okay, sure. And the king starts to like David. And... But then David does something really strange, which this is the thing that I really had to wrestle with. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. From ancient times, these people had lived in the land extending... Shur and Egypt. Whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but took sheep and cattle, donkeys, camels, and clothes. He returned to Achish, and when Achish asked, where did you go raiding today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of Jeremiel, or against the Negev of the Kenites, which isn't where he went, okay? I know we're not, like, super up on this geography stuff, but, like, just giving you the heads up, what he did and what he said he did aren't the same thing, okay? We don't need to get too technical. He did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us and say, this is what David did. So the reason he killed everybody is so they couldn't tell on the fact that he wasn't doing what he was saying he was doing, which doesn't exactly sound righteous and honorable. And such was his practice as long as he lived in Philistine territory. Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for life. So now David is stuck in a situation of lying. So he's gone over to the, the enemy, away from his people, Israel, to take, to take matters into his own hands and save his own life. So he started to lie to the king, saying, hey, so he's attacking people. The people he's actually attacking are people who are enemies of Israel. But then he kills everyone mercilessly. I mean, it's, it's, he's just raiding people, which is not something we would go, yeah, that's great. You know, and it's not God, God saying, hey, go do this. It's him just, I'm going to go do this, and he does it. It does benefit Israel in a way, but then he goes back and lies to the guy and says, no, I'm actually attacking these people that are kind of in Israel. So now he's, so Akish, the Philistine guy, is like, okay, well, they're going to hate him. So now the lie is getting all twisted up, and he's being really cruel to these people, killing off just everyone, men, women, children, everything, just, you know, and just taking things to build up the lie because he's got to keep it going, which is exactly what happens the moment we start taking things into our own hands. We start to dig the hole, and then you've got to dig it a little deeper. And then you got to dig it a little deeper. So I'm going to give David a low grade on this second story for trusting God because he's got himself in a situation now, which we'll see resolved in story four. But the Philistines are going to attack Israel. That's kind of the context here. So David's now stuck on the wrong side of the fight. God's people over here. He's already, or he's already anointed to be the king of Israel. Now he's on the wrong side with the Philistines doing bad things and lying about it, making the king think that he's cool. And now they're going to have to go fight Israel. And David's like, uh. But Saul over here, God has already departed from Saul. So Saul's like, hey, these guys are going to attack me. And last time David was here and I don't know what to do. So I need to pray to God to find out what to do. 
but God's already departed him, so God doesn't answer. So I'll give I'll give Saul a little bit of a good grade for the first day. Like he like he tried. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna seek the Lord, but the God didn't answer because God had already told him this ain't gonna work anymore. You know. So Saul goes, I know what I'll do. I'll consult a witch. She'll be able to help me figure this out. Which this is one of those things where uh, this is a weird story. So be, be be prepared. So Saul and the witch is a weird story. And I was I was joking with Kevin earlier that if we were like a mega church in the early 2000s, we would probably do a sermon series. It would be called something like this. So we'd be hip and relevant. And it would be like, strange things you didn't know were in the Bible. And this would just be one of the weeks. Week three, Saul and the witch. And uh, <clears throat> we're, not, we're not in that time frame or a mega church. So you can get rid of that. So Saul and the witch. Saul and the witch. So again, Saul tries to ask God what to do. God doesn't answer him because he's moved on. So Saul decides, I, I know what I'll do. I'll take matters in my own hands. So we'll, we'll check this out starting in verse 3 of chapter 28. Now Samuel was dead, the prophet. Remember who anointed Saul? He anointed David. The prophet would tell him what was up, but he was dead. And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his town of Ramah. And Saul expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. That's a good idea. You don't want the witches around, right? The Philistines assembled and, and came and set up camp in Shunim. While Saul gathered all Israel, I don't know how to pronounce half these words, so I'm sorry. While Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid and terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or the Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium. Some translations say which. So I may go and inquire of her. And they said, there is one in Endor. And Endor is a weird place. I have some photos of it that I want to show you. And uh, No, that's a different Endor, isn't it? I do think they probably, that's probably where they got the word from, though. But no, I, I, but they go to the actual place in Israel called Endor. And Saul disguised himself. He put on other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman, consult a spirit for me. Like I said, this is a weird story, guys. This is in your Bible, okay? So read along. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said, eh, surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. We have, why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives. This is weird. Hey, I need you to consult a ghost for me or whatever, but I'm going <laughs> to, in the name of God, I won't kill you. You know, whatever. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. The woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up, or bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out of the top of her voice and said, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. This is the point where my daughter and her friends would say, Stop it. Get some help. That's what Anna would say. Because <laughs> you're my daughter. Stop. Get some help. She would say that. And you would be right to say that. It would have been nice if some of Saul's people had said, hey, stop. Get some help. We need this. This is not a good idea. But they don't. <clears throat> so Saul says, responding, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. Saul, <laughs> this is, what does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do through this way. You know, Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and be become your enemy? Listen to this. The Lord has done what he predicted through me. So who changed in this situation? Did God ever change? No. <clears throat> the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to, your neighbor, to one of your neighbors, to David, just like David had torn the piece of Saul's robe last week, as Kevin mentioned, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines. This is bad news. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. 
which means you're going to die. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and all that night. So this is, as I said, a very strange story. But even the dead Samuel, ghost person, tells Saul the same exact thing that he's been telling him. He's like, this is, this is what God has already said is going to happen. Like, you didn't even need to do this whole weird thing that you did. And so I'll give Saul a pretty low grade because he can, he's dealing with a witch here and pulling up spirits and stuff like that. The interesting thing is Saul immediately fell to the ground because, you know, when you, when you encounter the truth, sometimes it can wreck you pretty bad especially if you've been really trying to do something else. The, it, you know, this song we were just singing, and Kayla, I want you all to sing that again. The Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. This whole thing is the truth. But sometimes the pathway to that freedom is, is wrecking, you know, and Saul experiences that um, just in his face. So story four, really quick. David and the Philistine king. So now this is, so David's in a situation. So now Israel is about to face the Philistines. David's now with the Philistines. The Philistines... Or you know, the king likes him, and they want you know. But the Philistines, uh, the 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 king likes David, but all the other guys they're not buying it, you know. Which this is an interesting just reminder. When we live who we truly are, it's just who we are, and it goes all the way to the core. And it's in, when it's, you know, in alignment with who God made us to be, it's just there. There's no defense necessary. There's no hiding. Necess- there's none of that. But when we start taking matters in our own hands and kind of trying to be somebody we're not and look like somebody we're not, like David's trying to look like he's fighting against Israel, but he's kind of not. But he's also trying to look like he's reading, he, you know, he's lying. He's killing, he's, he's being merciless to hide his lie. Not everybody buys it. The guy he really wants to buy it, he buys it, Okay. But when you're being fake, some people will see, all right? We need to remember that because you think you're fooling everybody, but there's people that can tell. And th- sometimes it's people like the prophets, like Samuel, when he comes in, he's like, hey, what you're acting like and what God told you aren't the same thing. And sometimes it's just people. So look at this. The Philistine commanders, the commanders of the Philistines ask, what about these Hebrews? Akis replied, is this not David who was an, or, or, they, or, or, or is this not David who was an officer of Saul, king of Israel. He's already been with me for over a year, and from the day he left Saul until now, I have found no fault with him. But the Philistine commanders were angry with Achish and said, send the man back. He may return to his place as you assigned him. You must not, he must not go with us into battle, or he will turn against us during the fighting. How better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? Isn't this the David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, and David has sins of thousands. So David called Achish and said to him, as surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you with me in my army from that day, from the day you came until today, I found no fault in you, but the rulers don't approve of you, so now turn back and go in peace, do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers, and David says, but what have I done, what have I found against my servant from the day I came to you until now, why can't I go fight with your enemies of the Lord my king, so this is a weird situation, because these guys kind of see what's going on. They're like, ah, I don't, we don't trust this guy. Get rid of him, you know, because he's not going to help us like you think he will. And he's like, but I like him. And he's like, I know, but, you know. And so he goes, hey, they don't like you, but I do. And David's like, you know, but what have I done? And you don't exactly know what context David's saying that in. I was praying a lot about this one, and I think there's probably a lot you could glean from it. But here's the thing I think that I want us to see today. Um, one is you can't hide everything. Like, you think you're getting away with stuff. You're not as much as you think. That's the first thing. But the second thing and the most important thing, I think, is that I actually see this as God getting David out of a bad situation because he was going to have to do something when he and I don't know exactly what that would have been, you know, and we don't know either. But David was digging that hole and then you keep digging and digging more and digging more and and then you get to where you're like, this is a problem. And then all of a sudden God just sweeps in. He's like, hey, you know, you don't have to deal with this. And you'll see next week other things do happen. But we need to see uh, God's role in these kinds of things, that God doesn't just leave us hanging all the time. I mean, you're going to bear the fruit of what you plant, but God is merciful and kind, and he gets us out of situations we don't deserve. Not, I mean, in the most grand sense, the salvation that Jesus offers on the cross is exactly that, 
But I mean even in like our little ways, in our lives where we've messed up things. Kayla, why don't you come up and start playing? I want to close with this. Because, like I said at the beginning, following God is difficult. And when we, in it, looking at taking matters into our own hands in the wilderness, because this is the biggest temptation. And I get it because it's a struggle. And David is this warrior king. So it's a struggle. This is the guy who stood up. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You know, he's the only one in Israel that's willing to face the giant by himself. This is a bold guy. So he's the kind, he's not the kind of person that's like, I'm just going to take this, you know, but then he's also the guy who's, you know, I can't raise my hand against the Lord's anointed right here. He he's understands who God is and he's dependent on him and all this kind of, and there's this weird tension between I am willing to do things. David, if you said like, I'm going to, well, David's just a wimp. He's not, he's the only person that would fight the giant in the whole group. Certainly not a wimp. He is the 10,000 guy, but and he gets in these situations and he knows that it's not God. Like, I sh- I sh- this is wrong and I'm not going to do it. And there is that struggle. And it's not so easy to always see when you're following God. There's times when you're supposed to act. And then there's times where you're not. And you don't always just get a list. You have to learn how to hear his voice. And you have to learn and have your character molded by years of following him because it isn't easy. And if people like David can give up, or maybe not give up, but make a bad turn here, it should show you how easy it is for the rest of us. Because it is. Because the wilderness brings it out of you. God had said he would be the king. He didn't say Saul was going to kill him. But somehow it gets in your head because of the circumstances, because of the things that we're dealing with. And it reminded me of this story. It's a story we all know. I'm going to read it. And it's when Peter and the disciples encounter Jesus in the storm and the boat, and Peter walks on water, because I think this is a perfect example of what our lives are like in this wilderness situation. And it's the one we're in, and it's not always your fault. I would actually say, mathematically, it's probably most of the time not your fault. We live in a fallen world of fallen people doing fallen things, And some of the things we do cause our own problems. And then sometimes we're just stuck in the problems. Like the disciples were. Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. This is Jesus making them do this. This is interesting. While he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Also weird. Remember? This is weird. I wouldn't expect Jesus to show up walking on the lake, personally. When the disciples... (laughs) They didn't either. Proof. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. So, again, bad situation, bad situation. And then somebody's like, well, it could, get, it could be worse. And then this happens, and then they say, it's worse. Which I have a slide for that. This is my second Star Wars reference of the day. And the moment is gone. Okay. Forget it, forget it. Forget it. It makes me happy, though. Um, It's a ghost, they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to him, No, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So the disciples are in a wilderness situation. Jesus comes, and at first, it's Jesus showing up seems to make the situation works from their perspective. Okay? So don't think that every time Jesus is showing up in your life, or whenever you're showing up on Jesus' behalf in somebody else's life, that they're going to be like, Oh, good. That's great. Oftentimes, it seems at first to make the matters worse. 
for varying reasons. But then he says, no, it's me. And then Peter's like, okay. This is such a, (laughs) there's a lot. I mean, again, this is like a whole other message. You just take it. Take it and pray through it. This is what the Lord is saying to us today. He calls Peter out on the water. But then Peter doubts and he starts to sink. He doesn't doubt Jesus because Jesus is cool on the water. He doubts the wind and the waves and him. Because you can't walk on water. This is not a surprise. See, just like David is in the situation, he's like, this Saul guy is going to kill me. That wasn't based on nothing. He didn't just make that up. That's exactly what the guy was trying to do. But God said, you are going to be the king. He didn't say, this guy's going to kill you. And in this situation, Peter's over here, and he's saying, you, you called me to walk on the water. But everything in me tells me I can't do that because you can't. And on top of that, on top of that, you say, we're in a bad situation right here. But at least we have a boat that's kind of working. So the first thing you want me to do is to leave the only thing that kind of works to do something I can't do at all? That's exactly what God, that, that's what you're telling me to do? And look, look, Peter's, I, I give Peter a lot of credit because he's the only one that's like, all right then. You have to see how insane this is. This is the only thing he has to like, that works. The only thing he has to get through this this time, this wilderness experience, this mess, this storm, the only thing that kind of works, and it's not working great because we're already in a, you know, we're not happy, but it's at least it floats. Now you want me to do something impossible. And that's exactly what God is saying to each and every one of us. And he's like, it's not because of you. Why would you think it would be because of you? Why would you think that you could, you can't walk on water. I can, and I'm calling you to walk with me. And that's it. That's the whole thing. There's no mysteries to this. It's not like a trick. It's not like, well, you know, they just thought Jesus was walking on water, but it really was a sandbar. No, like, look, guys, come on. You wouldn't write that kind of stuff down, all right? Get off the Discovery Channel if you're watching these kind of shit. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can't do this, but with God, you can. thing is jesus doesn't just end the situation one of the stories one of the gospels he does like just jesus shows up and all the winds and waves did. and they do it does die at the end but in the middle of it I, I jesus knows what he's doing he's like hey let's try it you know there's times when god could just and your whole life you know whatever whatever this thing is that keeps coming into your mind you know or all the crazy people in the world today i mean we're all kind of nuts the uh um yeah, i was like honey <laughs> The, uh, he could just end it, but he doesn't. There's a moment when in order to get closer to Jesus, in order to follow him, in order to be with him where he is, you have to do the unthinkable thing and step out of your little protective place in the wilderness and be willing to walk on the water. And you can do it with him. And you can't without him. You do sink. What Peter went from saying, I have faith in this guy, to my faith in myself in doing this is not so good. And he sinks. And Jesus is like, well, what are you doing? I don't think Jesus is like, you have little faith, you stupid idiot. I think he's like, come on, man. Like, you actually did it. Like, maybe he got ten steps. Maybe he got three. But all of them were more than everybody else in the boat. I'm going to read one more thing. Because we're all often tempted to take matters into our own hands. But the reason you need to see this walking on water bit is the things that God wants us to do, He wants to do with us, He wants to do through us, He wants us to be people He wants us to be, aren't things we can do by ourselves. So taking matters in your own hands is the beginning of it all being screwed up. You can't walk on water, just like Peter can't walk on water. But with God, you can. That's the whole thing. you got to follow Him. That's the whole thing. He's standing on top of it. He's not worried. I need to read you this quote. It's from a book I just read, and I actually highly encourage everyone to check it out. It's called A Non-Anxious Presence. It's a little heady. It's a little bit about, like, why everybody and why the world has been crazy the last couple years. And 
maybe as Christians what we should do about it. And I just highly recommend it, especially if you've been wondering that, like, why does everything seem weird? And why does all the church stuff we do seem weird? Or I don't know, like if you've struggled with any of that, this book will answer a lot of that for you. And he talks a lot about wilderness in it. And he uses a term that sociologists use called gray zones. And what that means is there's the end of an era when an era is ending and a new era is starting. And this happened in human history, like the, the creation of the Silk Road, the end of the Roman Empire, you know, the invention of the printing press. He has several other examples of these things where one era is ending and another era is starting. But it doesn't just do it like that. It's not like January 1, now it's totally different. There's an overlapping gap or an overlapping segment, which he calls a gray zone. The sociologists call gray zones, where it's messed up, where the old way of things is still happening, but it doesn't work as the same way anymore. Hello? And there's a new way that started, but nobody understands it yet. So some people are still trying to pull back, like, no, 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 come over here. We need to be back over here. This is the way things work. This is what, you know, power structures are inverted. Everything gets crazy, and anxiety goes through the roof, just like being in this boat. Jesus is calling us to be like him. He's like, it's cool, guys. This non-anxious presence is what, you know, that's the moment that we're in right now. But this quote, he talks about this, and the reason I explained this gray zone thing to you is because he says this in this quote, and you need to know what he's talking about. Because gray zones are times of uncertainty when the rules seem to change, and things that once were stable are shaken. We're tempted to circle the wagons and, you know, hide in the boat, get strong, you know, make tribes. These people, we were good. These other people are totally bad. You know, this kind of thinking, you know. And tempted towards what what they call fantasy, just an imaginary world or some sort of distraction, you know. We all just want to get out of it. Here's the quote. In a fantasy world, the only thing you can develop is more fantasies. The painful encounter with reality we experience in our gray zone moment opens up the possibility of encountering the deeper work God wishes to do within us. The gray zone frightens us. It reminds us of the primal chaos in a world that threatens to overwhelm us. It carries echoes of the wilderness, exposing our lack of control over the world. (laughs) Hello. And shattering our illusions and our idolatrous belief that we can live a life without pain. Let me read that sentence again. It carries echoes of the wilderness, exposing our lack of control over the world and shattering our illusions and our idolatrous belief that we can live a life without pain. Yet the scripture reframes the role of the wilderness for us. The in-between gray zone of the wilderness is a recurring theme within the Bible. Without God, wilderness, both literal and figurative, are terrible places, like Peter sinking in the water. With God, they become tools in our Savior's hands, schools of spiritual growth. The wilderness reveals the direction of our hearts, Our character is indeed shown in moments of challenge. Outside the protective worlds of our strongholds, we find out who we are. Outside the boat, we find out who we are. Do we grumble, wishing to return to Egypt? Or do we praise in the desert? Do we rebel or depend? Do we starve or eat manna? And here it is. Do we build a golden calf or follow the pillar of cloud? So guys, like I said, following Jesus is difficult. And oftentimes it doesn't make a lot of sense when evaluated from the world's perspective. Because when you're in a bad situation and the only thing you have that's good is a boat, and God tells you, you need to leave that boat to follow me, that doesn't make sense to people who don't know who that is. Especially they're like, that's a ghost, or you made that up. They're going to go, you're being crazy and you're going to die, you know. And they're not, again, they're not totally wrong. Like, without a God, you are going to die. But if you know him, you can do it. And that's following the pillar of cloud, like the Israelites when they left Egypt. And he's inviting us to do that right now. And I'm going to have Kayla sing that song again because I think it illustrates this in yet a different way. That the freedom that Jesus is offering us is the freedom from this way of thinking. And it doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to, if you define sense that way. 
And I'm going to invite you to stand and sing this song or to come forward and recommit. Say, you know what, God? I haven't been that great at following you lately, but I'm going to follow you now no matter where you say go because that's the only way. And you can do it because he'll do it in you. So, Father, open our hearts to be the people who are willing to step out of the boat and to follow your pillar of fire and cloud wherever you lead, whether we like it or not, or even whether we understand it or not. In Jesus' name, amen. So stand and come forward if you want to pray.